Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway. It's a very exciting video today because I have an all new Terrier locomotive to look at. This one has been a really long time coming, but here it is. At long last, I have my hands on one. It is the Rails of Sheffield slash Dapple slash NRM Terrier locomotive. Now, this model has been on quite a rough ride ever since this was announced way back in March of 2018. Hornby has come along, announced, released and sold their own Terrier model for over a year. Why? I mean, I can see what's in it for Hornby, getting a one-up over their competition, but as a customer, I have to ask, why? What is the advantage of flooding the market with two of the same product when they could have produced, I don't know, anything else and brought something new into the world? So you should know that Hornby have not done us, the customer, a great service by doing that. However, the Hornby Terrier was quite compelling because it was so much cheaper. So the RRP for the Hornby Terrier was £94.99, which is £15 less than I paid for the Rails version at £110. However, it sold at the retailers for £81, which means you can get the Hornby Terrier for £30 less than you can this version. But it's not just as simple as that. The story doesn't end there because if you remember my review of the Hornby Terrier, the quality wasn't quite as it should have been. There were quite a few issues with it, wasn't put together particularly well. And I've read online that other people have got issues with the accuracy of the Hornby models as well, which has led Rails of Sheffield to brand their model, the Pedigree Terrier. And that's something we're going to look at today. Were they right to do that? Because it's quite a bold claim. Anyway, the version I have here is Box Hill in the improved engine green. And yes, that is why I've worn my green shirt today. A lot of people have noticed that I try to match the Locos I review, so very well done. Yeah, it is a preserved locomotive, is Box Hill. Can't see it right now. I've not opened the box, so I really don't know what's going to be inside. Well, I do. It's hopefully going to be Box Hill. But let's get this out. Let's find out what this is like and find out whether it is indeed a pedigree terrier. So first things first then, really nice packaging. I think it is worth taking a second to look at this. Yeah, some really nice design work going on with that. I love the tracks in the background, the nice line drawing of the locomotive. In most cases, the first encounter you have with any model is always through the packaging. So that is done really nicely. Let me show the end of the box then. I've told you which version I went for, but it is 4S-010-001. It's a Terrier A1 LBSC improved Stroudly Green and it is Box Hill, and I'm very excited about that because I've always wanted an improved engine green terrier. I technically have one, I'm not even sure if that is improved engine green to be honest, but it doesn't look like it, does it? Let's put it that way to be safe. This one hopefully will because it's brand new and only just produced. Uh, the back of the box uh, is upside down. Yeah, this is a strange thing. Uh, this has been tested. There was a special instruction on my packing slip that said, please test. I didn't put the special instruction on there, so they've obviously tested this and had it out, so we'll bear that in mind. Uh, yeah, no information on the back of the model, just authentically detailed model, not suitable for people under 14 years of age and that kind of thing, which means we can now get this out for the very first time and see how this turned out. So, lifting the box up. All right, so we've got one of these, oh, still no big reveal. We've got one of these owner's manuals. I do like these, uh, they've done similar in O-Gage and they're just really nicely made. Yeah, as you can see, look at this, full colour. So removing the body, this is all important, I will be removing the body. Just gonna take a cursory glance right now, although I may read it in more detail before I give this a run. Uh, there's something quite interesting. You can see a bit of the drive train there. You've got, oops, is that the front axle or the back axle driven? That will be more obvious when I take this out. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is gonna cover all bases, isn't it? Spare parts, that's pretty good. Oh, there's another shot of the chassis, big chunk motor in there look at how much of the body is taken up with the motor there it looks also like there's a flywheel as well which is pretty good yeah that's all looking pretty nice look at this all of these parts laid out very nice a parts list as well very good all right yeah well that gives you a good idea of what the documentation is like very good by the looks of it let's take off the top then and see what's inside right so we've got a bit more conventional packaging on the inside you've got the sort of blister pack let's take this out then and see what we've got inside Wow, 
it's looking good. You can definitely see a bit of that improved engine green going on inside there. Very nice. Right, come on then, I'm not putting it off any longer. So we've got a very small detail bag up on top here. Yeah, just two little details on there, and I'm sure if I was to read the instruction manual more thoroughly, I would know exactly where those would go. So that's absolutely fine. And here we go, let's pull out this beautiful looking model. I'm gonna go ahead and call it beautiful already because I can kind of tell that it is. Oh, look at that, can you see that? Yeah, now that is improved engine green, look there. Right, come on then, let's see how this shapes up. All right, look there, very, very nice. So it feels reasonably weighty, that's pretty nice. The livery looks to be expertly applied and I really like the satin finish of that, that's fantastic. Uh, what catches my eye straight away is this beautiful copper top on the chimney. There's no way in hell that that is plastic and it really does show, doesn't it? I can tell just by holding it that the running plate like Hornby's Terrier is made of metal, that is die cast, so that's where a lot of the weight will come from. Yeah, this thing looks really good. So we will take a much, much closer look at this in just a second, but first of all, here's a little bit of history on the Terriers if that's something you're interested in. So also known as the LB and SCR Class A1, the Terriers were a class of small passenger locomotives first introduced way back in 1872 to the design of William Stroudley. Now, it was the distinctive barking sound produced by the exhaust beat which gave them their affectionate nicknames as Terriers, and even though the Terriers were getting pretty out of date by the time grouping of 1923 came around, the class remained in service under the Southern Railway, and indeed many Terriers actually survived well into the final years of steam, with the final withdrawal taking place as late as 1964, which of course helps to explain the ridiculous wealth of different liveries that these Terriers carried over the years. Now this example, Box Hill, was one of the later examples built in 1880. I say later, it's still pretty ancient, isn't it? And as I said earlier, it is a preserved example and it now resides, uh, I think it's on static display at the National Railway Museum in York. Of 50 terriers produced in total, a reasonably healthy 10 terriers survive in preservation. I mean, that's one in five, that's pretty healthy, isn't it? Well, the remainder, very obviously and quite unfortunately, were scrapped. So there it is then, the Rails of Sheffield slash Dapple slash NRM Terrier. And I love it, I think it looks absolutely fantastic. But if we're being completely honest with ourselves, there's no way you can call this a pedigree terrier, right? I mean, for instance, a pedigree terrier would need to have a straight running plate. Look at this one, it is positively convex, isn't it? Look at that. Hang on, I've got my train ruler. I'll try and line it up with the back half. Look at that really, really bent and wonky that. Now I read online, I had I knew about this, other users have posted this online, so I know it's not an isolated issue, but when I read on Rails of Sheffield's website that they were keeping remaining batches back to remould aspects of them, I assumed that that would be what they were fixing. Obviously though, seeing just how warped this one is, that is clearly not the case. And it's so bad that parts fitted to the running plate aren't actually seated properly. Look at the water tanks on the side there. There's great gaps underneath it on the left side because the running plate is literally warping away from it. Look underneath the smoke box as well, as you can see on the left side again, great big gaps. And that's a bit of a theme with the entire model, really. Many of the parts don't fit together properly. Look, you can see there's a big gap behind the front of this smoke box. I mean, the Hornby's wasn't like that in any way. Look at the top of the cab. That huge gap is dreadful and it's moving as well. I can touch it and it's not actually fixed in place. And look, it doesn't even have a coal load. How can that be? I mean, it's not an expensive piece to fit. And even if it was at 30 pounds more expensive than the Hornby version, there's no reason why you'd have to make it deliberately less realistic by not putting a coal load inside. The idea is that if you want more realistic coal, you can take out the one that comes from the factory and put your own in if you like, but not to have the factory fitted coal at all is a bit naff, isn't it? And also it's quite a lot lighter than the Hornby Terrier as well. Hornby's was 111 grams and this one weighs in at 100, so it's 11 grams lighter. It's kind of like 10%, it's quite a lot. So no, it's clearly not a pedigree Terrier. It's got quite a few quality issues. But as I say, many aspects of this model are really, really nice. The main aspect, obviously, is the decoration. I would say that the decoration is better than Hornby's. Not entirely. I mean, look at the running plate at the front here. There's a big sort of scratch out of it there. I did not do that. That was like that straight out of the box. And a few of the handrails have got bits of paint missing so that it doesn't quite have the finesse you would expect. But generally speaking, like I say, the decoration is better than Hornby's. So look at this. You've got the box hilt letter on the side. I mean, that's just got a real sheen to it, hasn't it? It's really, really nicely done. 
the part of the boiler that is most exposed, as you can see, you don't have that sort of crack where the chassis meets the body. You don't have that at all. It's a nice smooth surface. And as you can see on the whole, the lining is done really, really nicely too. And one thing I really like is the metal texture of the boiler itself. Look at that. Can you, hopefully that comes through. If you just catch the light, you can see that it's not smooth like a plastic would be. It has kind of got that, not bumpy, but slightly irregular texture that real locomotives actually have on them. So I think that looks really, really nice. And the top of the cab, even though it is ruined slightly by that huge gap, the colour still pops a lot more than on the Hornby version. In fact, I can do a comparison here because I've got an improved engine green Hornby version now, which I've kept quiet about. Yeah, it's a lot greyer, a lot more drab. In fact, if I do show you some comparison shots of the different aspects of the models, you can see that I think Rails and Dapol definitely win on the decoration. I've already mentioned the lovely copper topper on the chimney, which looks absolutely fantastic. The only downside to that is that the other high shine metal parts on the model look a little bit drab in comparison. So if I show you a photo of the real box hill, look at the cab windows, look at the boiler fittings and the pipework. Notice how they gleam and shine every bit as much as that copper chimney does. Except on the model, those parts just look like painted plastic. And on a truly pedigree terrier, there would be more consistency there. All the metalwork should shine as it does on the real thing. Sadly, that's just not the case. The running plate, while it is completely unforgivable that it's so badly warped, it is nicely lined as you can see, it's very very well done right the way across, as are the steps and of course also the buffers, look at the lining on those buffers, I don't believe my improved engine green version from Hornby does have that lovely lining on the buffers. Like Hornby's Terrier, the buffers are not sprung though, I guess, <laughs> I guess Dapol couldn't find a way to do that either uh, due to the design of the buffers of course, so it is an even playing field there. And then over on the other side, you've got this very, very fine Westinghouse pump, beautifully made that, and definitely a bit finer and probably more detailed as well, actually, than Hornby's version. So that's very, very good. Details like that are very well done. The smoke box area is nicely done as well. As you can see, you've got all of the separately fitted handrails, lamp irons, and of course, the smoke box dart there, as you would fully expect from something like this. Underneath the boiler, you do have the representation of the valve gear. I don't believe Hornby's did. So as you can tell, the level of detail is actually quite a lot greater on this model. The whistle on this model is made of metal, but then the safety valve equipment over here is, I believe, made of plastic. And again, you can see the slight mismatch in the materials there. But in terms of the finesse and the delicacy of these little parts, I can't really fault them at all. The wheel set is one to talk about. I love how fine the coupling rods and the fittings on those coupling rods are. They really do look good. And the wheels are nicely done as well. You've got that very unusual sort of Stroudly improved engine green, green tinge to the bottom of them. A little bit of a mess, if anything. Look at this one. This one's got all these odd black splodges all over it. I don't know what the deal is with that. But as you can see, the actual axle area isn't quite as good as Hornby's. You can see Hornby's look a little bit finer. You've got that little tiny pinprick in the center, which is where I believe in real life, the axle would be fitted onto a lathe so that it could be manufactured. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit more finesse there, in fact, where Hornby's goes. And I would say also that Hornby's underframe is very slightly better. As you can see, it's got this sort of gap through the whole chassis, as you would see on the real thing. On the Rails version, you have got that sort of gap moulded, which suggests it should be there, but you certainly don't have daylight going right the way through. So yeah, it's just minor things. Aspects of the model certainly have much more finesse than Hornby's, but it's not quite the walkover that perhaps they suggested it was with some of their marketing. But yeah, in some areas, I mean, if we compare the different chimneys, for example, there's really no comparison is there. Rails has done much, much better, that's for sure. Let's take a look at the cab then, which again is an area that I would say rails have done much better than Hornby's. So as I say, you've got all of the windows which are separately glazed. And if we look inside, you can see that that is the case. You don't have a glazing piece which covers two windows in one go. They are done individually, which looks a lot better on the inside of the cab, it must be said. Although again, it's not a complete walkover because you've got very clear sort of molding marks on the inside of the cab there. However, the gauges and such inside have been fully picked out. As you can see, that's really, really nice. I don't believe Hornby's had that. And then you do have the separately painted wood paneling on the ground, which looks good. And then you've got the handrails on the side as well, which are a bit wonky actually, aren't they? Should they be wonky like that? Or is it just my eyes? I can't tell. But either way, they appear to be separately fitted and also separately painted, which is very good indeed. So yeah, overall, it's not a bad model at all. I particularly like the decoration. Look at this on the side of the coal bunker there. Very, very fine print on there. The detail gets a tick, but unfortunately the quality lets it down hugely. You can fix glue marks, you can fix bent details, but how to go about fixing this massive issue with the running plate, I have no idea whatsoever. <laughs> Do you want me to slap it onto an anvil and try and hammer it into shape, thus disassembling the whole thing? 
I don't think so, not realistically. So it's a real shame about that. But overall, yeah, it looks pretty decent, I would say. Is it worth 15 to 30 pounds more than Hornby's? No, I don't think so, really. The Hornby versions aren't quite as detailed, but they do fit together properly, and the running plates are ruler straight on those, which I think is a bit more important, in my opinion. However, we are yet to cover the quality of the mechanism, and we're yet to see this thing run, so it could still be in the running. So let's do that now. I'll get it down onto the track. I'll have a look at the mechanism, and I'll feed back to you. So there she is then, lovely box hill down onto the track, ready for her first ever test. I've taken a look at the mechanism and it's good. I would say it's probably slightly better than Hornby's as well, on paper that is. If anything though, I would say that getting access to the mechanism isn't particularly intuitive for DCC and servicing purposes. For instance, when removing the body, I noticed that a lot of the electrical components were just held in place with tape. I had to peel off the speaker from the inside of the loco body to get it away from the chassis, and you'd have to peel off a circuit board from the worm drive cover if you want to access the gear train. It's a similar story with the base keeper plate as well. I had to dismantle the annoying brake rigging, which is made up of loads of different parts for some reason, just in order to get access to the axles and pickups. It must be said that Hornby's Terrier is much better designed than that. Four screws, you lift the base keeper plate off, all of the brake rigging is attached to it, you can do your servicing and then you're away. But like I say, the mechanism itself is really, really good. So you've got proper turned metal bearings on all the axles. That's the only way to go. The center axle is slightly sprung, very, very slightly, almost unnoticeably so. But if that makes a difference, I'm all for it. That's very good. And we do have proper wiper pickups, none of you have through the axle nonsense. That's really, really good because through the axle pickups have always been nothing but trouble. So that's really good. Inside, looking at the motor, you can see we do have a five pole motor inside there, which is nice. Hornby's version only had a three pole. Still no flywheel inside here though, which is a pity. So it is better than Hornby's, I would say, but only just. But that's all on paper. How does this thing actually run? Well, let's find out. First ever run. Let's give it a go. Forward direction. Let's turn this up. Oh, there we go. I tell you what, also, this has not been run in. <laughs> and that crawl was very, very good to say it had not yet been run in. Look at that. Now that is a good crawl. Well, it's not really a crawl. I'm not really trying a crawl yet. I'm just kind of getting it to go along nice and slow. That was over the express point, by the way. No cutting out there. That was very good. Sound, very, very quiet. It just, just sounds like metal on metal. <laughs> no motor noise whatsoever. So I would say, provided it gets through this video all right, I would say that the motors appear to be quality. Let's get that crawl. Can't really remember much about how the Terrier's crawl was from Hornby. Uh, we'll have to get my BR Black one running at some point. Uh, I won't run my improved engine green version because uh, I'm going to save that until I review that one. But that is really, really good. That is good. Uh, how's the speed? How's the gearing? Let's run past at 50% speed. There we are, really good, really good. Much slower than Hornby's, and that might explain why the crawl is so good, because it is geared to favor those slower speeds, which is good. And as I always say, if you want your Loco to go faster, you can use that top end of the speed spectrum, and you've got that speed there. The key thing is it's not designed to favor the high speeds, and I think that's smart. Okay, well, let's try and do as slow as we can before it's been running, and then I'll get it going around the layout. Now this is actually exciting now because we're starting to see some pedigree attributes here. That five pole motor really does look as though it's making a difference. Look there. And I, I don't think it's cut out at all, has it? I don't think so, I don't think I've had to nudge it. That's unusual, you know, when pickups are brand new, they sometimes do need a little bit of a run in before they conduct as well as they should, but I mean, I'm not seeing any problems. I don't think it's ever cut out. Let's be really nasty. Put it over the express point. Here we go. Let's move you. Right, front wheel approaching now. There we are, it's on the dead zone. Middle wheel on the dead zone, front wheel off the dead zone. Wow. <laughs> well, hang on, let's wait till all wheels are off, and then I'll say wow. Okay, they're off. Wow. That was superb. I reckon the performance is going to be good. That is great. Really, really good. Right. So I'll kick this off then. Let's get this going at 50% along the layout. Let's grab the Hornby 1, see what the crawl was like, just to remind ourselves. 
All right, let's give this a try now. I should say this has been running, so to be fair, we can't draw any conclusions until the Dapol version has been running too. But I don't think it matters too much because I think it's better anyway. But let's try. <laughs> it's cut out immediately. <laughs> right, try again. Crawl, please, if you can. Oh, man, it's... It's cut out again. Oh, no. I think it's safe to say that this ain't doing so good. It's just not sustaining it now. And this has been serviced, actually, since I got it, so I know that it's all good and clean. There we go. We've got a bit there, but it's just not sustaining it. The pickups aren't. Yeah, it's not smooth. It's changing speed. I'm afraid, well, on looks, I think Hornby have still got it. I think Dapol have actually beaten Hornby at their own game there. The performance is noticeably better. That 5.4 motor has obviously done its job. Right, let's catch up with the Rails Terry then, see where that's gotten to. Here it comes. No horrendous slowing down on that second radius curve, that's good. That sprung centre axle is supposed to help with curves and things, so that's good to see. Nice steady speed, I've noticed, up Gordon's Hill, no fluctuations. Oop. <laughs> oh dear, what happened there? Derailed on that curve. Let's have that again. Yeah, didn't like that curve, does it? Why not? I've never had a loco have problems on that curve before. Let's watch a bit more closely so I can figure out what's going on. Yeah. That's very strange. Let's see if the Hornby does that. It's like history repeating itself again, isn't it, with these Dapol locos derailing. Let's see if Hornby's does it. Now, I know my track isn't ideal, I mean, it's on the floor for a start, but other locos don't have trouble. Let's go again with the Dapol. Yeah, it's just every time, isn't it? Let's check the gauging. So there is, I'm afraid, a slight issue with the gauging on the Rails Terrier. The back-to-back -back distance should be 14.4 millimetres, and this one, if I take an average across each axle, is reading 14.6, so that's 0.2 millimetres more than it should be, and the front-to-back gauge should be 15.2 according to the standard, and this one is 15.4, so that, again that is 0.2 millimetres more than it should be, and the standard gives a margin for error of 0.05 millimetres, and so this is some four times greater than it should be. Hornby's Terrier, again the back to back should be 14.4, Hornby's is spot on at 14.4 so there's no difference there. Hornby's front to back gauge is 15.1 so that is just 0.1 millimetres out. It's much better gauged. My track is rubbish, that is true, that's what makes it good for testing on. If your track is well laid then you probably don't have an issue, but what is true is that the Rails Terrier is more sensitive to track than the Hornby version is because the gauging unfortunately isn't quite right. Now, I know there will be some people who will want to ignore my findings and just persist and focus on blaming my track. There's always a few. So what you're actually seeing here is every single 060 tank engine I own negotiating that curve. Now, if every single one, and it really is every single one, by the way, can do this faultlessly, and then a loco comes along that derails every time, you just can't blame the track, at least not if you want to be taken seriously. You have to look to the loco. Now, if it isn't the gauge issue that's causing this, the only thing I can think of is that sprung centre axle, because I'm still not entirely sure what the purpose of that is. The vast majority of my 060 tank engines do not have a sprung axle, and yet they work perfectly well without one. Now, I'm not saying that sprung axle is to blame, I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility, because a lot of locomotives are slightly out of gauge, but as you can see, very few of them, in fact none of them, are derailing on that curve. Here we go with the test on first radius track just to see how it handles those very tight curves, see if it's any better at those. As you can see, exactly the same thing. As soon as it hits that first radius curve, derails. That's anti-clockwise. Clockwise, it slows right down on the curve and sometimes even comes to a stop. So that's a real pity after we've seen how nicely this thing runs. Uh, it's now on the inside line. Fingers crossed it will be better off there. Ooh, not happy, <laughs> but it's staying on the track, which I think is important. So yeah, overall then, 
if you've got well laid track, which these days should never be assumed, should it? <laughs> With people like me in the hobby. But yeah, if your track is properly laid, then you shouldn't have any problems. But that doesn't quite excuse the fact that the gauging is quite a bit off. But overall, not too bad. There we are. Looks beautiful too, as it runs. So I'll let this thing run in. I'm really relieved that I'm actually getting it to do laps now without derailing, because I thought we were going to have the usual situation, like we had so many times with the 73 and goodness knows what else. But no, it seems like we're going to get away with this, so that's really encouraging. I'll come back to you after it's done 30 minutes in each direction. We'll do some more performance testing, talk about the pulling power, and see how that compares with Hornby's. All right, running in has concluded. There we go. And I'm very pleased to say that after all those derailing issues on the outside line, it's now run absolutely perfectly on the inside line. So that's really, really good. It's not a powerful loco, 0.11 newtons on the drawbar, which should be enough for around 10 coaches. So it is a shame that this model should be so light because even an extra 10 grams would, I think, have made it a little bit more powerful than Hornby's. Hornby's, incidentally, has exactly the same pulling power, 0.11 newtons, so there's no gains made there either. Anyway, let's do another slow speed test. Let's see how we get on with this. Is it any better? Is it even possible to get better than it was? Let's see. Turning it up real slowly. Backwards first. I think we need a bit more because it's not going right now. Oh, there we are. Hmm, that wasn't amazing, was it? Let's try again. Let's try forwards. Oh, slower, slower, slower. That's good. Look at that. That's really good. Really good. I think that. I think that settles it. I think Rails is the better crawler, definitely. Let's try backwards again. It's curious that it's not doing so well backwards. Oh no. Yeah, no, that is good, that is good, excellent. So as far as the crawling goes, it's really, really good. I like that a lot, that's great. It's obviously a good motor, um, no sign of a failure or anything like that, and it's done a good hours running actually. I went and had my lunch while it was going backwards. So it was more like 40 minutes backwards. Yeah, no sign of a failure. Really, really good. Must be quality motors. I like that. Anyway, as you can see, I have set up some Southern coaches, five of those in fact. So that's me. You know, I think that's a reasonable number. It should be easily capable of hauling those at least. Uh, well, let's try, shall we? Let's set this to reverse and let's have a go. Here we go. I like that crawl. I really like that crawl. Right. Have they got the couplings right, or have they messed them up? Uh, I can see the answer, folks. I can see it, because I'm right above. They couple properly. Let's give this a try. Look there. A successful coupling. What a breath of fresh air that is. There we go. 50% speed. Notice how controlled that is. There we go. Yeah, it's a funny old loco, that one. I mean, what an ambitious project to produce so many terriers with such variations in detail and such. And I suppose the funny thing is that, I mean, they got all the complexities right, didn't they? But then it's the basics, like getting the running plate straight so that everything fits onto it, or, or getting the wheels gauged correctly. It's things like that that they've fallen down on. It's a pity about that. Anyway, here is the Hornby Terrier. There it is, also with a five coach train, although this has got sort of old lever coaches which have got quite a bit of drag to them. Uh, so anyway, yeah, we'll see if it will manage those up Gordon's Hill. Fingers crossed it will. All right, and here's one for you. <laughs> so this is the old Dapple Terrier from decades gone by. And I remember when this looked like a good model, I was genuinely impressed by this when I first got it. I think those days are truly over now. I think between them, Hornby and Dapple, well and truly replaced the old terriers like that. So there we go, very nice. Right, here we go then with coaches. Let's see how this gets on. I must say, that looks a lot slower <laughs> than it did before. That's five coaches. So obviously there's not a great deal of torque in that mechanism. Look there, that's slowing down quite dramatically, isn't it? I have to be honest and say that, despite, I think, the fact that this Dapple version has a better motor, I have to say the Hornby does not do that. The Hornby is far more constant in its speed, which is strange because clearly this Dapple version has been geared to run very, very well at the lower speeds. So I'm not sure where that lack of power comes from, but there's the Hornby. 
and I think that's at less than 50% speed, but again, I don't think that's geared quite so well. And this one definitely doesn't like those second radius curves, watch this. Ooh, slows right down, strange. I think it is, I think that's probably the gauging doing that. Uh, I was looking into this after my Backman Hall class review, guess what? The gauge was out on that loco as well, and it does exactly the same things on second radius curves. Yeah, it's no puller, it's no puller, that's for sure. But that's a lap now. As of right now, that is one lap completed, so it can haul five coaches around my track. <laughs> but uh, yeah, with some effort, it seems. And again for you, here's the Hornby going over that curve where the Dapol derailed with five coaches. I wonder, I reckon I'm going to swap locos again and see now that the Dapol version has had a chance to run in, see if it's any better. And who knows, maybe having coaches coupled to it will make a difference as well. Maybe it will behave differently under load. Ooh, God, look at that. Yeah, there's, there's not much torque in the mechanism, I'll tell you that for nothing. No doubt about it. That's very unusual. Anyway. Cool. Oh, it's... Oh, dear. It very nearly ground to a halt there. Did you see that? That's strange, because I got the same... I got the same measurement, pulling power-wise, between this and the Hornby, but... Come on, stay on. Well, congratulations. With five coaches slowing it down so much, I guess it can handle that curve now. <laughs> Amazing. Right, well, let's speed it up. Let's put it to like 80% speed, because I want to know if it is the speed or the load that's causing it to work now. All right, so the controller is now set to 80. Now, that's very different. Look at that. Actually, this could be <laughs> catastrophic, couldn't it? Look at that, it's going for it. Uh oh, oh no, stop. Yeah, let's not do that again. <laughs> I did not like seeing it derail like that, but yeah, it is curious how much better the Hornby can manage this whole section of track with the same number of coaches. And by the way, this is at 40% speed. And by my logic, that should mean that it's got less torque because the controller's kicking out less power. And yet it's far more constant, and it's done it without any problems. Very unusual, that. Anyway, yeah, this one still looks lovely. It's just, yeah, <laughs> underpowered. But yeah, great runner. Absolutely no problems. I don't, I don't think it's faulty. I'm not sure. That's 50% speed too, by the way. Yeah, I think that's just the way it runs. But it's doing it reliably, and it's consistent. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm not inclined to suspect there's something wrong with the motor, at least I sincerely hope not. No, it seems fine, it seems fine, and yeah, I, I've got no complaints. If you turn the controller up a little bit, we've seen that it can go much faster with a load, so it's not really a concern, is it? It's just interesting how much having a load affects this loco. I'm surprised. All right, so let's do some ratings then for the brand new Dapol double O gauge Terrier. Now, I wanted to give the level of detail a five star here, but this is the only double O loco in my entire collection to have an empty coal bunker. So I can't rightly give this five star. It's got to come down to just 4.5 for that. But the detail was there, it has to be said. I mean, the decoration, superb. Never seen such good decoration, in fact. Very, very good. The number of separately fitted parts is absolutely amazing. I love the copper work on the chimney. It's a pity that other metal parts didn't match in their sheen, but overall, I don't think that's enough to knock any marks off there from the five star, so that's very good. Performance, again, maybe I've been a little bit generous here because of the derailing, but if I'm really generous and rate it on the way it performs on my middle line, I guess that's fair enough. Yeah, the slow speed, absolutely amazing. 
gauging, really, really smooth and constant. The only issue is probably because of the gauging, actually, you do see that very slight slowdown on some of those second radius curves, uh, which is not the case with the much cheaper Hornby version, of course. Pulling power isn't particularly good, 0.11 newtons, that should only be enough for around 10 coaches, that's less than Smokey Joe. Smokey Joe can manage more than this. Not dreadfully impressive. The mechanism, I'm going to give 4.5 stars. I've just knocked half a star off for the lack of flywheel because I think the best mechanisms do have flywheels. But you know, I get it, it's not a huge loco. I think I've had smaller locos that have had flywheels fitted, so it's not really an excuse. But overall, the mechanism's really good. Proper turned metal bearings on all the axles. You've even got a sprung center axle. I'm not really seeing any benefit to that. But you have got that lovely five pole motor, which really does a good job. And you've got a few extra throw-ins, like the working firebox glow, which I think is great. The quality then, I think, again, I've just had to be honest here and give it two stars. Now, some aspects of the model are real quality, like I say, the way it's been decorated, top quality. The die-cast running plate would be top quality, but of course it's been manufactured to such a poor standard. You've got that very noticeable bowing on the running plate, which is a great pity and therefore there are loads of gaps between lots of the different components fitted to that running plate but it doesn't stop there there are lots of other components with big gaps in them which just really ruins the finesse of the model it's no good the model being a bit more accurate than hornby's if it's just not going to be manufactured to a high standard so that's a real shame value then 110 pounds for this this is the i think that's the only price you can get it for it's not like it's going to other retailers where it will be cheaper so that is 15 pounds more than hornby's rrp and 30 pounds or 29 pounds more than you you can get it from the retailers. So what you actually get for that extra £30? Well, you get a lighter loco that is poor quality, at least in my experience. And while it does run better in terms of its slow speed and its crawl, it has issues on curves because it isn't gauged properly. I do, however, like the copper chimney. That's a really nice inclusion. And the firebox glow is really cool as well. Nice extra. However, it's not quite as good a value as the Hornby, is it? If it didn't have some of those issues, I might have been prepared to give it a four or possibly even a five. But I think three is the highest I can go for a Hornby. 110 quid. Overall then that is a reasonably a respectable score of 6.86 out of 10. Let's put that into the logbook there and there it is 39th just above the Dapple rail car and below a mystery loco which I'll have reviewed but I'm not going to reveal just yet. The model isn't what was promised but it certainly isn't bad that's what I'll say. So this is far from a terrible model. In fact, in many areas, it's really quite an impressive model. I think perhaps one of the things is that they set themselves up for a fall in the way this was marketed. I mean, if you're gonna say things like, don't settle for anything less than a pedigree terrier, or this is a museum quality model, you sure as hell better make sure that's true. I think if I'd said those things, I would probably have put some of that money into quality control to make sure that some of these silly issues aren't allowed to get through to the customer because after you've said all that about your competitors and how great this model is going to be you'll end up looking a bit of a wally if it's got really basic issues like this one does so yeah i think that's partly it i suppose if they'd just been more humble about it and not built it up to be something absolutely groundbreaking we might not have had such high expectations for this but as it is yeah it didn't quite live up to the promise but sure they're beautiful models i'm not convinced that they're worth 15 to 30 pounds more than Hornby's. I'm not sure that I would recommend that. I suppose ultimately it depends how many of them have these gauging issues and how many of them have these wonky running plates. I mean, uh, I, like I say, I know I'm not the only one. I know mine's not just an isolated example. If it was, then perhaps it would be different. Well, there you go then, folks. I hope you enjoyed that video. Let me know down in the comments what you thought. Have you picked up one of these Dapol Terriers? If so, I mean, slap a ruler against the running plate. Is yours straight? Uh, if you've got the facility to check the gauge, do so and let me know how far off the standard uh, is your model. I'd be interested to know if mine's a one-off. I think I see too much of this kind of thing for it just to be luck, but yeah, sure, I guess it could be. In that case, I should never buy a lottery ticket, should I? Because I definitely wouldn't win anything. But yeah, not a terrible model, like I say. Really like the decoration from any sort of distance. It looks very, very smart. Overall, not too bad. If you really want a decent terrier and you've got like 30 quid that you don't know what to do with, sure, go for this one. It's just as good as Hornby's, I would say. In some areas, slightly better, and in other areas, slightly worse. It swings and roundabouts, really. Uh, yeah, let me know what your thoughts are. But thanks for watching. Thank you very much for joining me, and I'll see you very soon for some more videos. All right, folks, you take care.